All right, guys, welcome back to the next lecture. Let's start with a multiple choice question. So as always, hit the pause button, try and figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. All right, the correct answer here is C. Let's talk about brown saccard syndrome, which is super high yield and it's very often tested. So we're imagining a theoretical, perfectly symmetric, one-sided hemisection of, a, of the spinal cord in this condition. Now, if we could pull off that feet, this is what you're going to get. Number one, you're going to get an ipsilateral loss of sensation at the level of the lesion, as well as lower motor neuron signs at the level of the lesion. So you can see findings like weakness, atrophy, fasciculations, and flaccid paralysis. So remember that those two findings occur at the level of the lesion. Then, ipsilaterally, but below the level of the lesion, we are going to see upper motor neuron signs as a result of corticospinal tract damage, as well as a loss of vibration sense, proprioception, and light touch. Now, which tract is responsible for these findings? If you said the dorsal columns, excellent job. And the only contralateral findings that we'll get are below the level of the lesion. So that should be a little bit easier to remember. So contralaterally, we'll see a loss of pain sensation, a loss of temperature sensation, and a loss of crude touch sensation. And this is due to damage to which tract? That would be the spinal thalamic tract. And one little nugget you want to remember is if a lesion occurs above a certain level, then Horner syndrome might occur. Now, do you know what level that is? It's T1. So if we get a lesion above T1, I want you to be on the lookout for ptosis and hydrosis and meiosis. Of course, hopefully you remember, those are your classic findings associated with Horner syndrome. All right, let's move on to the next question. Multiple choice, go ahead and hit your pause button, try and figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. Correct answer here is C. So what condition are we talking about here? This is Friedrich ataxia. This is inherited in an autosomal recessive manner, and it's a trinucleotide repeat of the GAA sequence, which is of course found on chromosome nine. If you didn't know that, now you do. Now this is going to result in an impaired frataxin protein. This results in a variety of findings, including things like spastic paralysis. This results from lateral corticospinal tract degeneration, ataxia, that results from spinocerebellar tract degeneration, a decrease in both vibration and proprioception, that occurs as a result of dorsal column degeneration, and a loss of DTRs due to degeneration of what? The dorsal root ganglia. Now, additional findings that I want you to be on the lookout for with Friedrich Tectaxia includes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is a common cause of death in uh, this type of patient, as well as pes cavus, hammer toes, and even diabetes. Now watch for a child with kyphoscoliosis because that is a common presentation or common finding seen in children who have Friedrich's ataxia. All right, let's move on to the next question. We've got a multiple choice. Go ahead and hit the pause button and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is B, HSV activation. So, Let's talk here. It's really important that you understand the innervation to the muscles of the upper and the lower face. This is one of those things that is very, very confusing if you don't understand it. But once you do, it really makes sense. So if you consider this image here, remember the following. The innervation to the muscles of the upper face originate on both sides of the brain. Now, innervation to the muscles of the lower face comes from the contralateral side of the brain only. Okay. Now, if we injure the cortex, the upper face will be okay because remember, the innervation to the upper face is bilateral. This is what you would expect to see in a case of a stroke. Now, if we injure the facial nerve, okay, which you can see in the second part here, um, if we injure that facial nerve, what we'll see is ipsilateral upper and lower face weakness. This is because despite the bilateral supply to the upper face, the injury won't spare that ipsilateral innervation because it comes after the facial nucleus connection to that cortex. So when we consider Bell's palsy, it affects the facial nerve, which if you understand the innervation to the face, it makes sense why it presents with weakness that involves the forehead, the eye, and the mouth. So to review, an upper motor neuron lesion will affect the contralateral lower face muscles, while a lower motor neuron lesion will affect the upper and lower muscles of facial expression ipsilaterally. 
Now, don't forget that Bell's palsy is most likely to develop after a reactivation of HSV, but other commonly known causes include things like Lyme disease, herpes zoster, sarcoidosis, diabetes, and even certain tumors, such as tumors in the parotid glands. All right, let's move on to the next question. We've got some true or false questions. I will stick around with you here. Uh, so don't, don't pause. I'll give you five, or se five to seven seconds uh, per question. Figure it out, and then we'll talk about the correct answer. All right, here is your first question. True or false, go. All right, guys, what do you think? True or false? This is, in fact, false. In the inner ear, we've got a snail-shaped fluid-filled cochlea. And here we've got a basilar membrane that vibrates when it gets hit by sound waves. And those vibrations are transduced by hair cells, which stimulates the nerve signal to the brainstem where sounds are perceived. Now, depending on the frequency of the airwaves, we'll sense them at different locations. For example, lower frequency waves are perceived best at the apex near the helicotrema. On the other hand, higher frequency waves are best heard at the base of the cochlea. All right, next question. True or false, go. All right, guys, true or false? This is false. The correct answer is the malleus incus and stapes. Now, that middle ear, what is it? It's an air-filled space, and it contains three ear bones. They connect the tympanic membrane to the oval window. Now, connected to the tympanic membrane is the malleus, and connected to the oval window is the stapes. The incus, which is the middle bone, will connect the two to allow for the transmission of sounds from the outside world into your brain. All right, next question, true or false? Go. All right, guys, true or false? This is true. So hearing loss is very common. It's very high yield as well. So there's two main types of hearing loss that you're going to need to know for exam day. That's going to include noise-induced hearing loss, which is fairly obvious what causes it, and presbycusis, which is hearing loss that's related to aging. Now, in noise-induced hearing loss, we get damage to those stereociliated cells in the organ of cordy. In this type of hearing loss, you'll expect that high-frequency sounds are the first to go. Now, this is also not necessarily bilateral, depending on the cause. In presbycusis, we will see progressively worsening sensory neural hearing loss that is bilateral and symmetric. Now, that simple fact there can help you differentiate between this and noise-induced hearing loss because with age, it should happen bilaterally and equally. Oftentimes, the onset of presbycusis will present with difficulty hearing speech, uh, where the person affected may say that other people are mumbling or they're just not speaking clearly or loudly enough. So if you get a, a vignette that explains that sort of interaction, let's say between a husband and a wife, that's something you want to keep in mind. Now, in this type of hearing loss, higher frequency sounds are mainly affected, and this is due to destruction of the hair cells at the base of the cochlea. Now, interestingly, lower frequency sounds are often preserved in presbycusis. Because of this, it actually becomes easier to hear men's voices versus women's voices due to their frequencies. So when you say, when you hear older couples and the wife complains that he never listens to me, there is in fact a logical explanation for that, which is this. Higher frequency sounds are mainly affected in presbycusis. All right, so very interesting. Uh, that's an interesting um, piece of information you can share with people, uh, especially uh, your grandparents or older couples who are complaining of these sorts of things. It's always fun. All right, next question. True or false? I'll give you five seconds. Go. What do you guys think? True or false? This is true. This is something I just mentioned in the last question. So if you're paying attention, this one is easy. Remember, it's for this reason why those afflicted can usually hear men's voices easier than women's voices. All right, next question. True or false? Go. Is this true or false? Hopefully, no, this is actually false. A loud noise, an acute, really loud sound like an explosion can absolutely lead to rupturing of that tympanic membrane. That would then lead to the loss of hearing in the affected ear. Now, this does heal with time, but it does cause hearing loss. Next question, go. All right, guys, what do you think? Well, if you have been through any physical exam classes, you know that this is true. It's really important that you understand the Weber and the Renee test. Now, this is something that clinically you'll need to know, but it's actually fairly easy to remember, so let's talk about it. So, the Weber test, if you recall, places that vibrating tuning fork on the top of the head. If there's no abnormality, you'll simply feel the vibration. If there's something impacting the ear, so for example, earwax, then this would probably cause the patient to complain of some muffling in that ear. 
Now, usually, we just look in the air and we can clean it out. But for the exams, we need to know how to diagnose conductive versus sensor neural hearing loss using these tools. So if we've got something like uh, earwax um, affecting wave conduction, when we use that Weber test and we have that problem this year, that tuning fork is going to isolate to the affected side. So if your ear is loaded with wax and I place that tuning fork on your head, the noise should increase in that affected ear. Now when it comes to sensor neural hearing loss, the opposite happens. The vibratory noise will localize to the unaffected side in a case of sensor neural hearing loss. Now, if you want to try to mimic this, I always, when we were doing CS uh, before it got canceled, I would tell my students, take your finger and just cover your ear. Just cover it like so you can't really hear anything out of this ear. Then take the tuning fork, put it on your head. That's mimicking uh, a, a, a something in the ear, preventing the waves from going in, and you'll actually notice that the sound localizes to that side. So that's a fun little way to test out what conductive hearing loss would be like and how the Weber test would help you localize or identify that based on localization. All right, next question, true or false, go. This is false. So this piggybacks on the concept from our last question. If you've got something in the ear canal, again, we can use earwax as an example, we'll have a decrease in air conduction because physically something is stopping the air from getting in, okay? Air can't get to that tympanic membrane, so there's no air conduction or it's decreased, and that just makes sense. So in the Rene test, when we hold the fork on the mastoid bone, it'll tra transmit sounds longer than it would through the air if there's something there. Now, just like with the Weber test, the opposite happens with sensory neural hearing loss, meaning that in sensory neural hearing loss, air conduction is greater than bone conduction. Now, just to make your lives easier, just remember one and the opposite is, is the case for the other type. So just to remind you again, the Weber test, conductive hearing loss isolates to the affected side. So if I have a problem on this side, let's say I have earwax, Weber should isolate there. If I have a problem on this side and it isolates over here, that means we have sensory neural hearing loss. In the Rene test, conductive hearing loss is characterized by bone conduction that's greater than air conduction, but in sensory neural, air conduction is greater than bone conduction. Okay, next question, true or false, go. All right, what do you guys think? This is true. First off, what is a cholesteatoma? So this is a lesion that develops as a result of overgrowth of desquamated keratin debris in that middle ear space. This lesion typically presents with painless otorrhea and it can lead to conductive hearing loss. Now, this could be congenital or it could be secondary to other things like a recurrent case of otitis media. Now, as it worsens, the development of conductive hearing loss will ensue. Now, in addition to hearing loss, if there are any symptoms, they can include things like pain in the ear, dizziness, vertigo, tinnitus, sensation of fullness in the ear, and of course, otorrhea, as I mentioned earlier. All right, next question, true or false, go. What do you guys think? This is false. Now, when it comes to vertigo, remember, vertigo is that sensation that the room is spinning around you, Dizziness, it feels like you're spinning. Now, peripheral vertigo, that results from inner ear pathology. Central vertigo from a lesion in either one of two areas, the brainstem or the cerebellum. Now, a condition known as Meniere disease is commonly tested, and this is characterized by a triad of findings that includes sensory neural hearing loss, tinnitus, and vertigo. Other things that you want to keep in mind with peripheral vertigo and the associated ear pathologies will include that there's an accumulation of debris and or there is dysfunction of the vestibular nerve. Now, central vertigo, as I mentioned, is the result of a lesion in the brainstem or the cerebellum, and that can occur as a result of neurologic disease, tumors, or stroke. Additional findings that are associated with the central cause of vertigo that you absolutely want to look out for in a vignette include nystagmus, diplopia, dysmetria, as well as a vertical misalignment of the eyes. All right, we have one more true-false question. Go ahead. I'll see you in five seconds. Is this true or false? This is true. So in addition to managing the symptoms, we can also implement something known as the Epley maneuver for BPPV, and we can use diuretics for Meniere disease. Now, Meniere disease is associated with an increase in endolymph where? In the inner ear. So certain diuretics, as well as a low salt diet, can get rid of some of that fluid and help with the problem. Now, the Epley maneuver is a maneuver whereby we attempt to dislodge the crystals that have gotten into the semicircular canals and move them back to where they should be, which is the utricle. All right, let's take a break. I'll see you guys on the next lecture.